This was my first year to speak at DEF CON in person. Before it's been virtual, I spoke there virtually in 2020 and 2021. Oh, wow. Congratulations. That's actually Thanks. awesome. <laughs> That's so cool. Got to speak at Black Hat and B Size Las Vegas during Black Hat and DEF CON. Going to not speaking, but going to Black Hat Europe next week. It's in London. So oh, my wow, company nice. has a has the booth. They want me to go work work the booth there. So all right, we can uh, go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. So we're gonna get started. So the first time I gave this presentation was at Pancakes Con. Uh, let's see, last year, uh, I was the, the keynote for that conference, virtual conference. And so I gave the talk a second time. Originally this talk was two different talks in one because for Pancakes Con, you had to do a security talk and then your second talk had to be something non-security related. So I did one on on health on hacking your health, basically on diet and exercise and that sort of thing. But uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Philip Wiley. I have my CISSP, OSCP, and the stands GWAPT certs. So I got my OSCP back in 2013, started pen testing in 2012. When I started pen testing, I had worked in security at that point for like seven years. Uh, I'd worked in, in uh, application security and network security, and I needed to learn how to hack. So I took the OSCP course. And so my current title is Hacker in Residence at Cognito. So my job there is I do our internal pen testing for our company, and then I do evangelism. So basically going to conferences, talking, teaching workshops, and, and, and that sort of thing, and doing company events. And so uh, I'm a former adjunct instructor from Dallas College. I taught uh, pen testing, web app pen testing. I was the one that started those programs there. Uh, the idea of doing the, the pen testing class or the ethical hacking class there was one that they had. I built the program out and ran that for three years and eight months. And then I added the web app pen testing course because I thought it was, you know, a skill set that students could use. I'm also the founder of the Pwn School Project and DEF CON 940, which is a DEF CON group in Denton, Texas. I'm the concept creator and co-author of the Pentester Blueprint, starting a career in ethical hacking. Uh, so this this started out as a class lecture. So each semester I would give this talk on becoming a pen tester. And that started back in January 2018 when I started teaching. Uh, some of the other instructors at the school that taught security asked me to come speak to their students, and I gave this presentation and then by uh, November of 2018, I gave this talk at our local security B-Sides conference in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and uh, gave the talk at several conferences. After that, I was featured in the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book and Wiley Publishing asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book and I thought of creating a book out of that conference talk and lecture. So I did. I'm also the host of the Hacker Factory podcast which is a really good podcast for those wanting to get into security or or those just have just recently got in because I interview several different people on uh, how they got into security. When I started out, it was mainly, uh, it was mainly geared towards pen testing, but then I kind of saw the need to, to expand beyond that. And so that's kind of uh how I started that that podcast. So I've been running, coming up on 90 episodes here pretty soon. I've had Dave Kennedy on there, uh, Lisa Knight. Uh, yeah, Lisa Knight. I've had uh, Tiberius, uh, the Cyber Mentor, and the Mayor, Joe Helley on there, just to name a few of the people that have been on there. So I like to share this slide because sometimes people kind of have self-doubt and don't think they can do uh, certain things and to prove to you that you can be a pen tester when I graduated high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a living. And, you know, I lifted weights, I was a power lifter. And my high school friends said, yeah, you should be a pro wrestler. So I went to wrestling school and I wrestled professionally. 
and that's actually a picture of me wrestling a bear. So I did that for for a couple years and got married and had to find a more stable uh, career. And so I went to a trade school to learn AutoCAD and became a CAD drafter. So I did that for a while. Through CAD drafting, I found out about sysadmin work. And so I taught myself how to build computers, uh, took a, a network operating system course, which was Novell Netware was the most popular at the time. It was actually, believe it or not, more popular than Microsoft, but that was before uh, Microsoft came out with Active Directory. You know, with Active Directory, it's easier to manage enterprise networks, whereas back in the NT40 days, it was a lot more difficult. But uh, so I worked as a sysadmin for a little over six years, moved into information security. There I worked in network security, and then the company hired a chief information security officer, and he put me on the AppSec team. So AppSec is where I learned about pen testing. I managed some of our third-party pen tests. Consultants would come in and pen test our applications in our environment, and I would manage those pen tests. So I used uh, web application vulnerability scanners in that role and learned about pen testing. So when I got laid off from my job in 2012, I applied for a job as a consultant doing pen testing. And one of the things there, and something to encourage you to apply for roles, if you don't think you have all the skills needed, you know, apply anyway, because sometimes these, these job descriptions are just kind of what they wish for, you know, looking for unicorns. And in this case, you know, I was missing the pen testing experience. I had some vulnerability scanning experience, security experience, but I didn't have the hacking experience. But the uh, hiring manager liked that I did a lot of self-study, that I had a home lab, and that I taught myself Linux, and that uh, I taught myself web design and hosted my clients' uh, web pages on my web server that I hosted at home. So hearing all this, he liked what he heard and, and, and gave me a chance. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to try. You know, if you don't try, then you're not going to get the job. But if you do try, you'll be surprised sometimes what what kind of good luck you can have. So what is pen testing? Uh, it's assessing security from an adversarial perspective using hacking tools and techniques. Also often referred to as ethical hacking. You know, I usually use that to describe what I do to people outside of the industry or out, you know, people like yourself, you know, you're familiar with this from studying security. But, you know, a lot of people outside of security or IT don't understand what that is. And it's funny how you would think telling them ethical hacking would make it more self-explanatory. But I run into people all the time that said, ask me if, if there is such a thing as is ethical hackers. So it's just like locksmiths. You know, someone could pick locks doesn't mean that, you know, that they're criminals and same things with same thing with hackers. Some people don't realize that that's a skill that can be used to secure environments. So as far as trying to, you know, during this this presentation, uh, I thought this was more appropriate because I have another talk, the pen tester blueprint, that just really gets down to the details of, of pen testing. And this talk is more geared towards uh, showing you how to get experience and how to get a job as a pen tester. And I forgot to mention, I also give this, gave this talk at B-Size Las Vegas this year, and also at SANS uh, Pen Test Hack Fest last year, I gave this talk as well. So some of the tools that you're gonna need experience with is vulnerability scanners. You need to understand how to do manual pen testing, uh, able to, you know, being able to identify vulnerabilities without using vulnerability scanners, but vulnerability scanners is part of the tools you're using. So you'll want to download like the free version of Nessus and install in your home lab or on your, your Kali Linux or Paired OS operating system and practice running a vulnerability scanner because you have experience running Nessus, then that's one more tool that you have that can help you get a job. Because when you get into real world pen testing, you're gonna be running vulnerability scanners because sometimes it takes too long to manually test everything for vulnerabilities. So you're gonna be running vulnerability scanners. And so you need to learn different uh, pen testing distributions. And so Kali Linux and Parrot OS are two of the, the most common and two of the best out there, two of the most stable uh, platforms for performing pen tests. And also, you'll also want to get familiar with running uh, you know, pen tests on Windows tools because Windows has a lot of administrative tools 
that are good for performing pen tests. You know, you have active directory environments. If you have the, the uh, administrator tools installed on your, your Linux or your, your Windows uh, OS, then you're able to do some things there. So it's some, some good tools to have, and it's good to, to, to be able to understand how to use Windows effectively for pen testing. And so the different pen testing tools like Nmap, uh, Metasploit, which is an exploit framework, and web app pen testing tools like Burp Suite, OWASP Zap, and other web application vulnerability scanners. So you need to know how to use these. And Linux, Kali Linux, and Parrot OS has a lot of these tools pre-installed or easy to install those. So learning how to use the different uh, pen testing tools, you need to, to understand how to use those. And so the skills that you're going to need are networking, be able to work with networks. And I would say go as far as even be able to work with Wi-Fi networks, because when you get a job as a pen tester, there's going to be opportunities to test the wired network as well as Wi-Fi networks. And then operating systems, uh, Windows and Linux, and you really want to learn Windows and Linux at a sysadmin level, meaning you can go in there, connect to a network. If you get access to, uh, say, like if you get a shell to a Windows or Linux system, you need to learn how to, to run uh, things from the command line. If you understand the Windows and Linux command line, you're going to be a lot more successful. Otherwise, you're going to be doing a lot of Googling to try to figure things out. So you really need to know that from a sysadmin level. And then knowing how to hack and pen test and reverse engineering. So running vulnerability scanners, this was kind of where I was at. I didn't know how to hack, so I had to gain these skills. I was actually performing pen tests on the job and was learning to hack while I was doing that. And one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, I started taking the OSCP course to learn that. I took eLearning Security's web app pen testing course to, to learn web app pen testing better. And so reverse engineering is a really good skill to know. Say if you're doing a pen test, you run across a APK file for Android apps. If you're able to reverse engineer that, you may find that there could be hard coded credentials, usernames and passwords in that code to access an application. And if you're able to reverse engineer that, you could get those credentials and access those environments. So you have a username and password. Also with Java files, so if you're able to find Java jar files reverse engineer them, you can find some of the thing, same types of things. Uh, I performed pen tests for companies before where I reverse engineered a, a Java jar file and it had like the login credentials for, for the database. So I was able to get access to that. So be able to reverse engineer are, are good skills to have. So pen testing experience of how to get it. So this is gonna be one of the main things that we're, main focuses here is to help you see where you can get this experience. So professionally, where you're getting this experience uh, to actually get the hands-on experience, professional real-world experience, let's go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll cover this one first. This kind of really needs to be in reverse order. So the educational hands-on experience, this is what you're gonna need before you get to the point where you're going to be able to uh, have the skills to take advantage of environments where you can get the professional experience. So capture the flags, hack the box, and try hack me. These are really great resources. And the things, things I like about hack the box and try hack me, and especially now, hack the box has their academy. Uh, they kind of, kind of duplicated what try hack me was doing by showing different educational uh, lessons in there where you go through and it'll show you how to run in map. And then you go through and you actually run in map. So it gives you the lesson you duplicate it hands-on to get the experience. And so Hack the Box and uh, Hack the Box Academy and try Hack Me give you those. And then after you kind of gone through the learning piece of it, you got to hack the box to practice hacking on the different vulnerable VMs to, to hard to you know, hone those skills. And you hear some people in the industry that complain about the OSCP and you know some of their some of the complaints are valid, but at the same time too, I've heard people complain about the OSCP exam being too much like a capture the flag. And the thing about it being like a capture the flag, some of the best pen testers I know are really good at capture the flag. And sometimes capture the flags, they give you scenarios that you wouldn't see in real world, but sometimes these scenarios are to help you learn how to hack and, and better uh, improve your skills. So, that, so that's a good thing. Uh, home labs using different vulnerable VMs are an option. 
But nowadays with all the great resources online, you have over the wire uh, CTF and under the wire CTF. Those are great to learn these skills. You really don't have to set up a home lab, but the home lab is an option. Uh, at one time, we were really more dependent on, on home labs, building home labs, downloading vulnerable VMs. So CVE is Common Vulnerability Exposures. This is actually where you're getting into, and we're gonna cover this in the, the professional experience too, but learning how to detect these vulnerabilities. Uh, and this is detecting things that haven't been detected before in a particular product. And what, you, what you're getting here is experience as a security researcher. And when you look at security researchers, there's some people out there in the industry that call themselves security researchers and they are, but they're not finding vulnerabilities. They're reading up on, if there's been some new exploit, they're out there reading different research on it, writing articles and blog posts about that. They're not really technical uh, security researchers. They're more journalists. And so there, you'll see a lot of people out there, even some people that write books that are based, they call themselves security researchers, but it's a different type of security researcher. But the type of security researcher I'm referring to is people that are finding vulnerabilities out there, uh, finding O-days, finding things that, that uh, you know, for the first time that no one has found before. Uh, and sometimes this includes bug bounty hunters too. So bug hunters are in this category. And finding the CVEs, is kind of a good way to get experience because not all pen testers have CVEs, which this is a lot of times uh, you talk to a lot of pen testers or security researchers, they regard this more highly than they do certifications because you found something in a production environment that hadn't been found before. Essentially you found an O-Day and this is kind of a badge of honor for pen testers, hackers and security researchers. So in a lot of cases, this is better better than having a uh, certification. And you're doing some of the things here that you would do looking for bug bounties, but bug bounties, uh, you're looking at software that's been installed in environments and some of these could have been hardened and maybe you're not able to find bugs. But with the CVEs, uh, Joe Helly that goes by the mayor, he's got this Medium article and I highly recommend that you read that. And if you check out his medium, he's got all sorts of tips on finding CVEs. So what he did one night, he was just kind of bored and he went out and did some Google searches on like uh, content management systems for hotels or free and open source uh, CMS for hotels. So he found these different CMS platforms and he installed it in his, in his environment at home and he went ran through and performed a pen test against it. And then he found vulnerabilities. He's able to document it, submit it to these companies or through different uh, resources online where you can submit these. They give you a CVE number. And so you go look at that vulnerability, your name is on there. So this is something that you can prove. You know, if you perform pen tests even, it's kind of hard to prove that you did the pen test because you're not able to disclose the reports. So that's a little more hard, harder to, to, to uh, display but with this you're able to show okay i performed this i got the found these cves you can go out and look at the cv id and see what all it entailed and all that so that's a good way to get experience and so back to getting the professional experience so as i kind of mentioned bug bounties this is crowdsourced pen testing so you have bug crowd hacker one synatic uh there's a, a bug bounty platform over in europe called integrity and some people say that's a better one to get on when you're starting out because Bug Crowd and Hacker One have so many researchers, sometimes it can be difficult to find vulnerabilities. And with bug bounties, you only get paid when you find vulnerabilities. And one of the things that really kept me from getting much into bug bounty was the fact that I had pen testing experience. I could get jobs doing pen tests. I've had companies that I do side projects, you know, pen testing, and I could do a bug bounty and get paid if I find a bug, or I can go do a contract pen test where uh, I've got a company companies that I can make anywhere from $113 an hour to $125 an hour. Why would I wanna do a bug bounty where if I was lucky, maybe I found a $300 bug. And sometimes you find duplicates, someone finds it before you. And the thing is, if you're doing the bug bounties, don't get discouraged if you're finding duplicates. 
because you are finding vulnerabilities. It's just a matter of you doing the bug bounties more frequently, finding the bugs before someone else does. And that's why the CVEs is a good option because you can go out there and kind of do like Joe's doing, find these free and open source softwares, install in your environment, find bugs. You know, maybe you might get some kind of bounty from some companies, but I think most cases you're just getting credit, but you're building up a resume. The more of these CVEs you have on your resume, the, the better it is. And so uh, bug bounties is a good way to get experience, but the CVEs it is great because you're able to go through and test these environments that haven't been uh, you know, some cases there have been updates, but sometimes these free and open source softwares, they just don't have the security budget or the team to keep things secure. So it may be a good way to find some, some bugs and report on those and get a CVE. And pen test as a service. So this is basically Cobalt, Synac. I think BugCrowd offers something like this now and maybe even HackerOne. And with the pen test as a service, you can sign up for Cobalt and Cobalt will will uh, assign you a pen test and they'll pay you $1,500 to perform a pen test. I think the time requirements are like 30 to 35 hours. You know, it's, it's for, for a pen tester, that's not the best money, but the thing is, once you get the experience performing pen tests, now you got pen test experience. So now you can get a full-time pen testing job. And so, uh, so with Cobalt and Synac, they have challenges that you have to go through to be to join their team. So Synac Red Team, they have some challenges out there on hack the box that you're able to go through. And once you're able to, to complete those challenges, uh, then you can apply for the job. And I think they put you up in rankings of who they interview first for Synac Red Team. And then with Cobalt, Cobalt, they basically issue a challenge. You, you apply, you don't have to have pen test experience. Uh, they will give you a application to perform a pen test against. So if you have been studying, you're learning pen testing, and you're comfortable about doing a pen test, then you apply, and then you get assigned a pen test. You go through, write a report on it, and if you do well, then you get you get uh, brought on to do contract pen tests. And so this is not having to have any experience, and that's the most difficult thing when you're trying to get started, is finding a company that will let you join entry level without experience. People do that a lot, but this is another option in case you're having a hard time. It's a good way to get experience and learn. Uh, and then also there's pro bono and low cost pen testing. So basically doing free pen testing for nonprofits and or small businesses or some individual business owner you know, if you got your parents or your family or someone in your family owns a business, some cases they don't have the budget for pen testing, you could perform a pen test and so that gives you experience, you're able to document it. You can do this for free, but say like if you could do a pen test for a low dollar amount, then you're, you're, you're demonstrating that you have professional experience, you've been paid to do a pen test. So if you got paid $50 to do a pen test, you're getting paid. So if you get a little bit of something that's better than nothing, and uh, some cases maybe you're not able to charge the $300 an hour, but maybe you could charge $20 an hour to do the pen test, you're getting experience. And so sometimes churches, uh, different religious uh, organizations need pen tests done and you're able to offer that for free. So that's a way to get that experience. And really lean heavy on the trying to get into the pen test as a service or bug, bug bounties because uh, a, a fact I recently learned back in 2020, I was looking for a, a new pen test job and I was interviewing with this well-known uh, boutique pen test firm and boutique firm just means they specialize in certain types of things that you, you're really usually really highly skilled respected companies and I was talking to their hiring manager and he said that it was harder to find network pen testers but it wasn't as hard to find web app pen testers because of bug bounties uh, people are performing bug bounties getting experience but it's a little bit harder to get that kind of experience on network pen testing but at the same time too, even if you like network pen testing and that's what you want to do, I would recommend you learn web app pen testing because a lot of people that I know here recently that are looking for, for jobs that are, you know, red teamers or 
network pen testers and they're they're getting stumped on these interviews because people are asking them if they know web app pen testing. So this is getting a lot more common. And I attribute a lot of that to companies going to the cloud. More and more companies are going to the cloud, their applications are in the cloud. So there's less, you know, maybe the, I don't know if it's overall this way, but one of the things I can see is less need for network pen test, your traditional uh, on-premises networks. You're probably not going to see as much of that with the applications going to the cloud, but you'll see a lot more application stuff. So you, you see a lot more of that. So you want to make sure you're getting that experience. And so uh, getting that experience is going to go a long way for, for getting a job. And as I mentioned, you know, it's getting uh, a lot more of these people I'm talking to that are having difficulties finding jobs, moving from other network pen testing jobs is because they don't have the web app pen testing experience or not enough of it. And so demonstrating the skills that you have. So these are some things that can go a long way here. And one of the things that ever since I wrote the book, The Pen Tester Blueprint, the pen tester blueprint shows the prerequis prerequisite knowledge you need to be a pen tester. Like, as we kind of mentioned earlier, the networking, uh, the operating system, Linux, hacking skills. But you need to be able to demonstrate that. And one of the areas I've seen people uh, get jobs because they've done these steps, and this is things I've seen since writing the book, is people doing write-ups on uh, different VMs, maybe things in Try Hack Me or Hack the Box. They do write-ups on different vulnerable VMs, uh, write articles. You know, you can write an article on how to use certain types of tools. You learn how to use a new tool. And this is a good way to get experience, get experience with it. Go out there and, and do some research. Then this you're kind of looking at security re research in a sense of a journalist research, a security researcher. Go out there, research the tool, learn how to do it. Write an article on how to do that. Post it on your blog, uh, GitHub, or Medium. Medium is a good platform because other people that have same interests will find you because you can tag your posts, you know, with offensive security, pen testing, or hacking that other people are trying to learn or other people interested in that topic will be able to find you. So it's kind of almost a social media uh, attribute or crowdsource attribute that will get people to your articles. Otherwise, you have a blog, then you're going to have to get out there and share on social media, share with your friends, share on Slack and Discord, and get the word out to get people to your blogs or have good search engine optimization. And sometimes that could take a while to build up, but on Medium, you can start getting viewers fairly quick. So do write-ups you know, on these different vulnerable VMs, uh, different uh, try hack me rooms, different hack the box rooms, uh, blog posts, and then GitHub. And then the CVE, ID, CVE IDs, getting the CVEs, that is something you can demonstrate that you have the skills and the experience. And then tools and tool and technique uh, demos and walkthroughs on video, so on YouTube. This is something where uh, people are, are doing these walkthrough videos. A good example is She Networks. She's got a TikTok that was really popular, that really got her noticed. I don't know if you any of you have heard of Black Hills Information Security Group. She got hired by Black Hills Information Security Group. Now, mind you, she had a security background. She was working for Cisco, but she would do videos teaching Cybersecurity. She started out teaching networking, got into some cybersecurity and, and using hacking tools. And Black Hills Information Security Group saw this and they recruited her. And now she's a pen tester. And part of this got her the job because she was doing these TikTok videos. And and the same thing has happened with people that are doing YouTube videos. You see people like the Cyber Mentor. The Cyber Mentor was doing videos to educate. Originally, was to educate himself. But then to help others, he started out doing YouTube videos long before he was a pen tester. And there's been other people that have done these videos and have been recognized and have gotten jobs by that. So hiring managers will see these videos and see how you do a certain way, do a certain thing. You're using these tools, but they see how you think because there's different ways to use pen testing tools. Uh, and there's different ways, you know, uh, I just recently did a, a walkthrough for the advent of cyber for try hack me they had me do some videos last year and i did a couple of videos for them yet this year and there was one of the challenges that there was another way to perform the task how to hack uh 
this system and I use the different tool and I demonstrate that. So hiring managers will get to see, not even just hiring managers, people that be interviewing you for the job, they'll be able to see how you think, how you use these tools. And it's like almost like a technical interview. And another example where I've seen this helpful was at our local DEF CON group in Dallas, DEF CON 214, DEF CON group 214. There was a recent college grad that gave a talk on malware analysis. And through his talk on malware analysis, a hiring manager from Citibank was there watching his talk and asked for his resume afterwards because basically he kind of had an impromptu technical interview by doing this presentation. He demonstrated his presentation skills, you know, a talk at a meetup group conference on these videos is going to show your presentation skills as well as your technical skills. So that kind of helped him get his foot in the door. So writing scripts or programs and sharing, sharing it on GitHub. Maybe you found a script and you found ways to enhance that script. You know, you fork that GitHub repo, add in your changes and stuff to make it perform this different functionality or whatever. And just sharing this stuff out there has gone a long way for helping people get jobs because at one time these weren't really options to help, but you got it to, you really have to do this to get the chance to get your foot in the door because people are looking for experience. And these are things that I've seen people leverage to get to get jobs. And so another thing is what we're talking about just recently, just that past slide, it's just slide we just completed, is talking about, you know, the walkthroughs and all this, uh, blogging, write-ups and GitHub. So build your brand. That's one of the things that's a side effect of that is building your brand. You know, this can be done through content creation, uh, one of the things we didn't really mention as much in detail, but streaming on Twitch or, or YouTube, uh, as well as creating video content, doing this stuff live, writing. If writing is more your thing, then write articles on Medium, uh, you know, a blog or GitHub. Write some articles, you know, show how to do, uh, use different tools. And then speaking, conferences, different cybersecurity meetups. And you can even go pat beyond this. So maybe there's a... Uh, some uh, web development group in your area, and you can go and meet up and find these different groups. A lot of cases, they're looking for different uh, speakers, and security is a hot topic. So if you can go in there and present on you know, application security or how to pen test applications, you can do these different talks. So uh, conferences and cybersecurity meetups, different meetups are good places to to actually get experience uh, speaking. And and one of the things that's helped m my brand a lot. Uh, is from doing several of these things. So for me, you know, I have a podcast. That's another area of content creation that you can have there. The video is is probably probably a better a better way. But uh, building my brand has made it a lot easier for me to get jobs. And so there's some people in the industry that are influence social media influencers, and that's mainly where they get their their draw from. They're getting their attention. I mean, some people speak at conferences, and I kind of do both of those as well as being author of a book. And I know people in the industry, so the more you get your name out there, the easier it is to find a job. And, you know, I have people reaching out and recruiting me because of what I do in the community and speaking and stuff. And uh, it's just, it gets you out there known because some people, if you could be the best hacker in the world, but if no one knows about you, then you're going to have to rely on applying for jobs going through the interview process and all this, but if you make a name for yourself, then it's gonna make you more noticed and it's gonna give you opportunities that other people wouldn't. And one of the things I'll say is some people that could be even, you know, people even more highly skilled than me, I'm able to get opportunities that they're not finding just because they really hadn't worked on their brand. They really hadn't worked on, spent that effort on their brand. And so along with the brand is your, your professional networking. So another thing that I've done to build my brand is through uh, conferences, local meetups, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. I know there's been a lot of uh, drama and a lot of people disappointed because Elon Musk acquired Twitter and think it's going to crash or go, you know, it's going to go away, but I'm not giving up on it yet. Uh, InfoSec Twitter is has a strong presence on there and it's a great place to find resources as well as the network with other people. So using online communities like this 
uh, whether it be Discord, Slack, you know, some, some of the message boards or other messaging type uh, softwares, use those to network. And uh, when you're at these cybersecurity conferences and meetups, go up and introduce yourself. If you know people from LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, go up, meet these people, introduce yourself. Uh, because what happens is if they know you're trying to find a job pen testing and then they hear about it, they will pass on jobs to you or refer you to jobs. I've done the same thing for people that weren't even my students. I used to help my students get jobs, but then I would find people in the community that I knew they were looking for a pen test job and I would recommend them because I knew them from the community. I knew kind of what they've known and studied and what they want to do and kind of saw, you know, their ambition and desire to get into the industry. So I'd be able to share that. So just getting out of networking is huge. I mean, out of any of these things, the networking thing you want to do, building your brand is a good thing that I would do, but, uh, you know, definitely get out there and network. I mean, this is a, a great way to get opportunities. I have people approach me to do paid speaking and stuff. And I had IT Pro TV because of my brand asked me to do a paid uh, webinar for them on becoming a pen tester. And so there's my contact info. We can open it up to the Q&A portion. And I'm gonna link that to Twitter. And one thing, uh, check out my YouTube channel because my YouTube channel, I have a playlist of my lectures for the, the uh, pen testing course I taught at Dallas College. So I have a whole semester of lectures and in those lectures, uh, I was using the Pentest Plus book for the textbook. But one of the things I did too is I did some hacking demos and uh, gave lectures based on my experience as a pen tester going outside of just the book. I've had some people that have actually passed the Pentest Plus that watched my videos and they said that actually helped them uh, preparing for the Pentest Plus. So that concludes the the presentation, but we can open it up to, to questions. Awesome. Thank you so much for the presentation. I learned a lot and it was really cool. Um, now I'll give it to Richard and he'll lead the Q&A part. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. That was awesome. I can't believe you fought a bear. Like, <laughs> that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> All right, Richard. And, I'll hand it and, go, to you. and going back to going back to branding, that's kind of one of the things that I've kind of neglected to mention. Is it's funny how that that bear wrestling picture did nothing for me as a pro wrestler. That didn't help me for anything. But working in security, I share that with people. They see that and they remember me. So if you yeah, got that's something I'll never forget. You, so if they know you're a gamer, you know you're really into the you know or you're really into soccer, these different things, people associate that with you and that's kind of part of your brand. So that that type of thing helps. Yeah, thank you, Philip, for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, do you guys have any questions in the chat? And if you don't have questions now, feel free to to message me later on. I'd be happy to answer your questions. I do this stuff a lot. You know, I do a lot of mentoring still. Uh, although I'm not teaching at the college, I do workshops from time to time. I just did one for B-Sides Orlando. I did a workshop on web app pen testing. So I still like to teach just outside of uh, the college. Looks like we have uh, quite a few questions now, if you want to pick one, Richard. Okay, so uh, let's see. So what are some common interview questions that people should expect? Yeah, some common interviews you're going to see, interview questions, is the OWASP top 10, even though it may not be a dedicated web app pen testing role. Those are some of the most common vulnerabilities that people know about, like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and just going through and learning the OWASP top 10, understanding the vulnerabilities, how to remediate the vulnerabilities, and understanding the risks, how those could be used, how they could be, why they're a risk. So getting through and understanding that. And when you're getting ready for an interview, prep for the interview, study, 
And this is something that if anyone, even someone that's experienced will do, especially if there's, if they, they're planning right and they're smart, uh, is to prep ahead of time myself and a lot of the people I know that are experienced will go through and review things because you're not always using these things all the time. And, uh, you know, a lot of times as a pen tester, you need to take good notes and keep track of that because you're not always going to get to perform these certain types of attacks or have to validate these vulnerabilities. You're going to keep good notes, but study things like the OWASP top 10. If you're hiring, if you're interviewing with the hiring manager, sometimes they may not be as technical. Maybe they've kind of been away from pen testing for a while. So one of the things you can do there is just kind of make sure you understand the fundamentals, brush up on that, like the three-way TCP handshake. Uh, when I went, got interviewed for U.S. Bank, I was hired by the, the director and he hadn't done anything technical in a long time. He's just been management. But one of the things you always kind of remember is kind of the basics and fundamentals. And those are the kind of questions that I got. So just kind of understanding that. Uh, some of the things you'll get to, some of the questions I, uh, I've actually, on the team I was on, we interview people. We've asked questions like, if you have a shell to a system, how do you tell what operating system it is? And so in that case, uh, if you've got a shell to a Windows box, you know, it's just the directory structure, you know, uh, you know, Linux or Unix, it's LS, the directory uh, listing. If the POSIX plugins are installed on Windows, sometimes LS may give you the directory listing, but not typically. So just look at the directory structure and you'll be able to, to see from there running commands within that shell. So those are some, some of the, the type of questions you'll get. Uh, and just like different types of tool usage, you know, they'll ask you what type of tools you have experience with. And one of the things when you're writing your resume, if you're using something, kind of document that how you, what experience you have with it. So uh, if you've got Burp Suite on there, you've only used it and, it, you know, your experience is kind of limited. You may list on your uh, education that you've been, that you've took courses or training uh, or studied that topic. Because one of the things you want to be careful of is if you put something on your resume and you don't have experience with it, the interviewer is not trying to stump you. I mean, sometimes you run into some jerks and gatekeepers, but that's not the norm. If they see Burp Suite on your resume, they're going to want to understand how well you know Burp Suite. Maybe that's a tool that they need someone with that skill on their team. So they're going to they're going to want to see how much you know about that. So I've seen people before they would just put a bunch of tools on their resume wanting to get the job, but you're kind of directing that interview. The interviewer is going to see these different tools and they're going to ask ask you questions about those tools. Awesome. Okay. Uh next question. Uh how long would you say it took you to break into pen testing over the years? When you look at what I did, that would have taken, for, for me to break into te pen testing, when you'd have to really go back to the beginning of my sysadmin uh, career. And as far, as far as just applying for a pen test job, the first one I applied for, I got. But this is six years of sysadmin experience, you know, seven years of security experience, with six of that being application security. So when you look at it, I had like 13 years of experience, 12 or 13 years of experience before I got in. But that doesn't mean it's gonna take you that long. Uh, one of the things people always get, uh, and people have different views on this. Some people will say, yeah, you have to work desktop support or help desk, be a sysadmin before you can be a pen tester. You don't have to, but, that experience is helpful, but at the same time, too, if you can learn those skills, you know, if you can learn Windows and Linux and networking, understand, know those, then you can move on to pen testing. You don't have to have all those years worth of experience. You just have to have that knowledge. I've seen people that uh, I had a woman in my class that was probably late 40s, early 50s. She went to school, had a to University of Texas at Dallas, had a computer science degree, a four year degree in computer science, took several courses at Dallas College, and she had tried forensics. She just wasn't getting interviews and getting hired. 
she took my pen testing class and she was able to get a pen testing job. Part of that was, was through networking. I referred her to a hiring manager, which happened to know her and he was looking for entry level uh, pen testers. But I've seen uh, several other people that were in my class that first job they got was pen testers. So it's just, it just all depends on the job. I would say whenever I got in, it was kind of easier from a competition standpoint because there wasn't a lot of competition. Not many people knew about pen testing roles. At that time, hardly anyone knew about the OSCP and it was only people that was working in security that knew about it. Uh, some people knew about the CH but didn't realize it was an actual role. So competition wise, it was easier back then. But nowadays there's a lot more jobs, but there's a lot of competition, but that's just a matter of, uh, sometimes consulting companies can be more difficult to get into. Sometimes they're not. Uh, some consulting companies will hire new security professionals, you know, recent grads or recent uh, certification recipients and hire them because they want to mold you. They want to teach you their, their ways of doing things. Because someone like myself has been pen testing for uh, over 10 years. They bring me in. I may have some bad habits and it may be harder to get me to do things the way they do because I'm used to it. So a new person, you can mold them into your way of doing things. And that's that's a good thing. And in some cases, some consulting companies want you to have the experience. But typically, internal jobs, say like if you're going to be a pen tester for a bank, uh, some retail organization, you know, different types of companies as an internal resource, not consulting, sometimes that can be easier because as a consultant, you're getting thrown into a bunch of different environments, having to learn new things quickly. And those are really good learning uh, opportunities, but it's easier typically to get a job inside of a company as an internal pen tester opposed to being a consultant. Awesome, awesome. Okay, um, next question. We'll do a couple more. Okay. So, what was the most challenging part in becoming a pen tester for you? Learning to hack. By far, Learn, learning to hack was the most difficult. And that's how I took care of that after going through the OSCP. But yeah, that was the most difficult part. Because the thing about other things, learning how to network, there is a book, there is a blog post, there is something out there everywhere on how to do Cisco routing, you know, how to do Windows administration, how to do Linux and Unix administration. But when you get into hacking, you know, that's, not you know that's not the norm these things aren't supposed to happen when you take some things like you know default credentials default username password that's kind of easy stuff but then you get into buffer overflows and writing exploits that could be more difficult so the the learning to hack was the most difficult part probably the hardest thing out of anything i've done but the good thing is there's lots of great resources to practice that Try hack me and hack the box are really good resources to to learn how to hack. Okay, and how do you feel about the recent tech layoffs? Yeah, I really don't like that because I think it was kind of a knee jerk reaction. I really think they should have waited things out, but I think partly of what's what happens there is we you know we're kind of in a in a world where companies want to be publicly traded, and part of the side effect of being publicly traded is sometimes companies have to, to do cost reductions to look good to the board. Uh, you know, sometimes they're advised by the board or, or their investors to, you know, to cut back costs, and that's kind of where they do it. And I think some of those, some of the things that triggered it was like the layoffs from like Twitter, and I think even Meta and some other organizations had some big layoffs, and I think that kind of maybe triggered some other companies to do it. I really don't think, I think you really should wait because you don't know how soon the economy is going to, you know, how, th how soon things will turn around. So you really don't want to, and then that leaves you having to go back and hire all over again. But one of the things too, that's one of the reasons too, if you're working in this industry, always make sure to have your resume up to date, always be networking because that way if something happens, you know, you're ready to, you know, look for a job to go somewhere else, just like, some of the people I know, I was just talking with someone 
on LinkedIn today through Messenger on LinkedIn, and they were talking about how they're starting to look because it looks like they may have layoffs. So if you're you know working out so working somewhere and it looks like there's going to be layoffs, you know make sure to have your resume updated and and be ready to find something else. But you know once you've got the experience, it's not that difficult. I'm really not hearing anyone having a hard time uh, finding jobs. So you know there's still a bunch of jobs out there. People aren't having a hard time finding them. So I think that's kind of a kind of a good thing. The layoffs are are not not good, but you know there's other companies that are hiring. Okay, um, one last question, and then that'll be it for the Q and A. So, what point along your cybersecurity journey did you feel like you climbed over a wall that prevented you from progressing, and then felt that much more confident in your abilities? I guess one of the things with me, I guess, would have to say teaching. Because when I got into teaching, I spent more try time trying to teach others and probably didn't spend as much time as I should have on self-education. I was still, you know, companies I worked for that provided training, I was getting training, I was still doing training on my own. But when I started giving back to the community, doing mentoring and teaching, I didn't have as much time because this is a hobby of mine too. You know, pen testing, hacking, security is, is a hobby of mine. This is what I do a lot in the spare time, in my spare time. But what happened was that spare time was spent talking to fine young people like yourselves, speaking at conferences, teaching a class. And this was taking up time that I could have been spending uh, working on another certification or learning. Because when I was going through the OSCP, you know, I was working as a consultant. So when I was off work, that's what I was doing. I was spending many hours learning and that just kind of reduced the hours. But one of the things that kind of make me okay with that is one of the things I've kind of found out is, or kind of seen is the world needs coaches and mentors and teachers. And, you know, I always want to be the best I can and, and try to be one of the best in the field. And one of the things I kind of came to the conclusion was that I'm a better mentor and teacher and coach than most people. So that's where really where I put my emphasis at, my time and effort. And I'm good with that because I'm able to help other people. Okay, um, so we are approaching an hour and there's still more questions. Um, are you comfortable with answering it, more questions? Sure. Okay, awesome. Um, so the next question, um, let's see. So what, what's the best way to set up a home lab to give yourself experience? One of the things I'd recommend is I would not overcomplicate your home lab. And one of the reasons that I say that was back when I was teaching myself how to, or when I was doing web design as a side business, I had a Linux server at home, so I had Apache web server running on it. I was hosting email and I was using, I would buy, I would get a new PC or build a new PC and my old PC became my web server. And so there was times I'd have to come home and troubleshoot, fix hardware, rebuild my servers because I was hosting, hosting at home. And what I learned from that was I'm gonna use a hosting company that way I can spend my time on what makes me money. Mind you, the experience I got was great. I got the experience and that was good, but it got to the point where I didn't need that experience anymore. And so I moved to a hosting company so that way I could spend time doing what I need to do to get paid. So same thing with learning how to pen test. So if you're building, you know, you can get your own individual routers and switches and servers and desktops and build this as com complex as you want to, but if something breaks, you got to fix and troubleshoot it to use your lab. So that's one of the things I really like the idea of using TriHack Me, Hack the Box, and some of these other uh, options, as well as uh, you know, over the wire CTF and under the wire CTF. Those options like Pico CTF, some of these other CTFs, those are those are great options. But if you're going to build a home lab, I would say keep it simple because you're trying. If you need to learn the networking and stuff, building the servers, then do that. But if you're just really needing to work on the, the pen testing piece, then download a VM like Metasploitable, the Metasploitable series, 
Metasploitable 2 runs on Linux only, but Metasploitable 3, you can, uh, there's a version to run on Windows or Linux, and you need to learn how to hack both of those. And with the Metasploitable vulnerable VMs, it's equivalent to multiple servers worth of VMs. So it, uh, Rapid7 created that as a way for people to learn how to use Metasploit and to test out Metasploit. A lot of companies that make vulnerability scanners will have online websites that are open to the public to perform pen tests and scanning against. So the Metasploitable series, there will be a bunch of vulnerabilities to work through. So just like downloading Metasploitable 2 and Metasploitable 3 and getting those set up and working through those, that's a great place to start. And then as far as applications goes, Juice Shop is a really good one for learning web app pen testing. Okay, great. Uh, I think that's that's great for questions. Um, before we end the stream, are there any new projects or books that you want to let us all know about before we end the stream? Yeah, not really. I've considered another book, but I'm not really sure whether I would do that. Uh, some of the other things I've considered too is, you know, with Pwn School, uh, I really started it to be more of something educational. And what happened over the years is I would get different people to come in and give presentations. And it ended up being much like a lot of different, although it's usually more beginner friendly and educational than most uh, talks that you'd see at some of the security meetups. So one of the things I've been considering is maybe uh, doing something with that, and and instead of you know a lot of you know I teach workshops, a lot of conferences, do some workshops periodically under the Pwn School brand, offer some free training for people. Awesome, great, yeah. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much, Philip, for coming onto this uh, live stream and presenting this presentation. We all learned a oh, lot of valuable information. I enjoyed it. And if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to me and connect me on LinkedIn and Twitter. One of the things I do is when people are looking for jobs, I will share with my network that, you know, you're looking for jobs and I've helped several people get, get jobs that way. So. I really appreciate your time. And I just got to say, I admire you uh, sharing your knowledge for free and just being so open about it over the years. And, you know, you've inspired like literally thousands of people, if not more. So. Yeah, man, just uh, keep doing you, and I really, really appreciate it. Thanks. It's like they say, it's better to give than receive, and I really didn't truly understand that until I started teaching and mentoring and doing all this. And it's just, you know, it's it's better than money. You know, it's just it's just good for your soul. It just makes you feel good, and you're able to help others. And and you set a good example. You know, in this world, we need to to set examples for people to give help others uh, because you know. People can be jerks, and you know uh, we need to set a good example. And if you set good examples, then other people can carry that thing on, that uh, those things on. And it was kind of cool. I've had some a couple young women that I've mentored that that are going to college for cybersecurity degrees, and uh, I've inspired them to speak at conferences. So they're speaking at conferences and volunteering and stuff. So they're you know basically paying it forward. They're doing the same thing. So it's a uh, yeah, it's a it's a lot of fun, and it's just kind of one of the ways I've kind of built my brand is helping others and kind of being the nice guy. That's kind of how I've kind of built my brand. Well, awesome! Thank you very much for for taking the time out of your day coming on, Philip. That is an honor. Thanks for inviting me. Yep. Thanks. Have a, have a good night, everyone. Yep. See you, everybody. Thanks everyone for joining.